Good evening, good evening, good evening, everybody. I am your host, Jones Harwell, and this is Journeys with Jones Harwell. We are waiting for our guest this evening to arrive, Mr. Gerald Moore. And while we are waiting, I just want to say happy Holy Week to everyone. Hope you had a wonderful Palm Sunday. I know Easter Sunday is coming up on the weekend. And for those of you that uh, believe in Jesus Christ and our Lord Savior, hope that you have a wonderful Easter weekend. I got an opportunity last weekend to spend Palm Sunday in New York City. And I have to say, um, I hadn't been to the city in a while, and but it was an excellent, excellent weekend. I got the opportunity to spend some time with my sister in Christ, my spiritual advisor, godmother to my son, uh, Minister L. Chanel. A lot of you uh, do look at her page. Um, she is the visionary behind Mini Street, uh, which she ministers in the streets of New York at a playground. And it was just a beautiful occasion celebrating her first year anniversary of ministering in the streets. So I got to participate in that celebration with her, and it was wonderful. I thank her so much for extending the invitation for me to participate and join with her and be a part of that celebration. While we're waiting uh, for our guest, I just wanted to do a couple of public announcements, PSAs. First off, I am a member of the business group think tank, Signature Entrepreneurs and Masterminds. We are having a meet and greet on Friday evening from 7 to 9 p.m. If you are interested, uh, please come out and join us. The cost is $25. If you go to Dr. Larry White Sr.'s page or even on my um, social page, Lisa Harwell, or my business page, Jones Harwell on Facebook, you'll be able to see the information. You can also go to VIP Events Concierge to purchase a ticket. We will be uh, strictly enforcing social distancing. Uh, parking is limited. So if you want to network, meet some new individuals that you can um, make some business contacts with, please come out and join us on Friday evening from 7 to 9. And again, you can find all the information on Dr. Larry White Sr.'s page or VIP Events Concierge. Dot com. Also, I am a new business. I have a new business venture. It is t-shirts and I have two spots that you can go and check out if you're interested in uh, inspirational t-shirts. The first is at Jones Harwell and I actually have two. So I'm going to stand where you can see this one here, which uh, any of you following me knows that I'm constantly talking about my boss lady mood. So here's the t-shirt here with my logo, my beautiful cartoon face on it. I'm so excited and happy about that. You can go to jonesharwell.com and shop for this shirt. It comes in gray, black, or white. I have sizes from uh, unisex small to 5XL, and then I also have a tie-dye of this same shirt um, rocking it. I have another gray, black, and white shirt that is your story, your journeys, our history. It's a good conversational piece. And give me just a moment here. I've got to do the invite to our host here, our guest here. He's on his way on board. So let me make sure that he gets it so he'll be able to join us here. And just one moment, everybody, while I'm getting that information to him. 
and he should be on here momentarily. Also, if you go to Jones Harwell Boutique, that is all one word, J-O-N-E-S, blah, 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 J-O-N-E-S, H-A-R-W-E-L-L -L, Boutique, all one word, dot com. You can also see my Journeys t-shirt there, and the Journeys t-shirt represents uh, my podcast platform, and uh, I have a couple of sayings there as well, uh, my story your story, our, your journey, our history, unapologetic, um, because the name of the show, Unapologetic, Journeys with Jones Harwell. And let's bring our guest on. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, Lisa. <laughs> How are you today? I am doing wonderful, Gerald. I am doing wonderful. I thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and talk with us this evening. I'm going to tell everybody a little bit about you, and then we're going to get right to it because I know you have a lot of information you'd like to share. And let's see how we can help you get some things done in the community. So, ladies and gentlemen, on the screen with me this evening is Mr. Gerald A. Moore Sr. He is a speaker, best-selling author, nonprofit founder. He is a uh, best-selling author of the book Motivate Black Boys: How to Prepare Careers in STEM. You're also the founder of your nonprofit organization, Mission Fulfilled 2030, and that vision is to inspire, educate, and activate 100,000 Black boys in tech and STEM programs to bridge the digital divide and make a dent in the income of the wealth gap, wealth gap particularly in Black families. You're also a graduate of Norfolk State University. And let me scroll up here so I can get the rest of your. It's not going to let me scroll up to get the rest of your information. But yes, it is Norfolk State University. You have more than 20 years experience as a federal government contractor in information technology, cybersecurity engineer. You've also worked as an educator teaching high school and middle school technology. And you are a powerful STEM and corporate DNI speaker. And you leverage your story to help troubled youth change the narrative for black males. Through your experience in corporate America, you also use your voice to discuss race in the workplace. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Before you get started, because I want to make sure we talk about your, your annual birthday trip as well, because I saw the pictures <laughs> and I was blown away. <laughs> I was blown away. But welcome to this show, Gerald. How are you this evening? I am great, Lisa. Thank you for having me, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be on the show this evening. Great, great, great. So let's talk about your program and why. T t I think your background, a little bit of your background, will tell the story as to why you are so dedicated and so passionate about your nonprofit organization and helping young Black boys break that divide by seeing that there are other fields and other work opportunities available than just the simple, I'm going to be a rap star, I'm going to be a musician, I'm going to be a football player or basketball player. But initially, well, when you think about young Black males and those, those four things you just mentioned, well, you mentioned three, right? So mm -hmm. Black males coming out of the inner city, we believe we got four ways out, the NFL, the NBA, hip hop, and drugs, right? right? All entertainment type industry or mm -hmm. flash lifestyle industries, right? Mm -hmm. And the right. NFL is right in our face and the NBA and, and hip hop and entertainment, those things are right in our kids' face of what the vision of success is. And then in the inner city, for our youth in the inner city, our drug dealers may be the face of what success looks like because they can drive the nice car mm -hmm. and have a fancy whatever, but that that that's a short lifespan. And all of those careers, it's a very short lifespan. Then the NFL, 95% of NFL players are bankrupt five years post-career. 85% of the NBA players are bankrupt post-career. Um, most of our most of our 
hip hop <laughs> folks, they never make any money in the first place. They're just showing a glamorous life, right? And then right. all of our drug dealers end up in jail. Like 99% of them are going to end up in jail, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not a it's not a viable option, actually. But mm -hmm. most of us are aspiring to do that, right? And right. I fell right into that, right? I fell right into that. My whole goal was to be an NFL player. I was an all-state football player in upstate New York. Like I was an all-state football player. I was an all-city basketball player. Um, I was in a rap group, right? I DJ for a rap group, I highlighted a career. Me and my buddy, we had a group called the Arctic Circle. We actually opened the show for the Fugees in Lauren Hill. Wow. So like I aspired to do all of those things and did a lot of them well. Never had to sell drugs, but one of my best friends growing up was a street pharmacist. I never had to do it. They protected me from that because I was supposed to be the star athlete to make it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But in that, I fell into all of the traps that young black males fall into in the inner city. By 12, I had my first police encounter. By 14, I got expelled from school from fighting, right? At 15, I did the Scared Straight program in Rochester, New York. At 17, I fathered my first child and had full custody of my son at three months old, I was a senior in high school. So a lot of the, the traps that young black males fall into, mm -hmm. I fell into. But at the same time, I realized once my son was born that I was going to give him something different than I had, right? Mm -hmm. and I have family at home. My mother and my father was home, but I'm from a blue collar city. Like the aspiration was to graduate high school and go work for Kodak. Right, <laughs> that right. Was aspiration, right? But the neighborhood I grew up in, you know, just wasn't probably the best neighborhood. Like by the time I was 18, 15 boys that I grew up with played youth sports with, you know, that were just in my community that I had personal relationships with dead. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I didn't want that fate. I knew what that looked like. And I just knew I needed to, to get out and do something different. Um, I graduated high school with a 1.69 GPA. And that doesn't get you into college into anybody's engineering program. But fortunately, Norfolk State University had an open enrollment policy and I was able to get into school and then test into the engineering department. But at the same time, as a young black male, I never had a black male educator my whole K through 12 career. Black males make up less than 2% of the public school workforce, right? Right. We look at a situation where at birth, at birth, Black males have a 28.5% to go into state or federal prison at birth. <laughs> so we're not looking at great statistics for young black males. And there's a lot of systemic reasons why. And I can't take on all of those systemic reasons. But what I know I'm equipped at is teaching young black males how to come from a situation that I came and how to get in the engineering game or getting the tech game, even without college. So my whole organization is dedicated to that and getting black men involved with black boys in tech. Mm -hmm. So he's been very successful at that. And the book Motivate Black Boys actually tells my story, you know, to help families and, and help mothers who have young sons. Here's the model, here's the roadmap of how I did this and you can duplicate it. Right, right. And it, it's not just even from 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 young men coming from single parenthood, even two family parent, you know, parent right. households, they can benefit from that. I know yesterday I was having the conversation with my son and another young man. They were coming from training and they are they are athletes. And I'm not going to discount athletes because if you know that you can take that and segue it in, into something else. Um, that still is changing your environment. That's still uplifting you and bringing you out. And you know, it's it's rare that because the, what they should look at is the at, model themselves after the athletes that's made it. So go look and see what LeBron James did different versus somebody else. Go look and see what Richard Sherman did different than somebody else. Go look and see what Michael Strahan did different than somebody else. You can see uh, Shaq. Uh, I can go on, Kobe. But you can see that they propelled themselves out of their sport to still provide a platform and a role model for kids to say there's more than sports. Build yourself a roadmap after sports. Use sports 
if that's if that's your ticket and you know that's your ticket and you're good at it and you're really good at it to propel you to do other things. I'm trying to remember uh, the young gentleman that during his off season, he was still going to medical school. He's a surgeon, neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. Robert, Smith did that. Robert Smith did that. He yes. Used to play for the Vikings. Yes. So, you know, I, I love that. So when you talk about, but still you're giving them an option to say, here, even if you don't make it to school, say your grades aren't great and you don't make it to school or you or you get to school and you find out that college is still not the next level for you, you offering the programs of STEM early allows them to see that there's something else. Um, I know down in the county that I live in, um, and if you, I know you're, um, are you still in the state of Maryland or are you in Virginia? I'm in Virginia, but I'm still doing work in the whole DMV and Baltimore. And mm -hmm. I just launched, I got a program I'm launching in Rialto, California. So wow, you know, we, we work in nationwide right now. Okay. Okay. Where's Rialto near? Uh, where do they say Rialto near? Don't get me to making stuff up. Okay. Well, we'll have a conversation <laughs> offline because I might have somebody that can help you out there. Okay. Let's have that conversation offline. But I know in the state of Maryland, one of their things was was to make the kids uh, either college or career ready. Right. And they could, once they entered high school, they could go the college path, which would give them the college courses to help them once they entered college, or they could go the career path, which would give them the opportunity to come straight out of high school into a career. Mm -hmm. And for my son, uh, what was disheartening for him was he entered the career ready path for mm -hmm. IT and was supposed to have uh, his junior year and saw his his junior year be able to have at least two certifications coming out of high school. Mm -hmm. COVID came last year and they didn't get any sort of, he has no certifications coming out. And we fought for him to stay at the school when we moved because mm -hmm. he tested into the program. Right. And he really wanted to stay with the program because he's like, I don't want to do barbershop. I don't want to do fire. I, you know, I, I want to stay here. And so it was kind of a little bit disappointing, but in the same sense, he could still put on his college application. Guess what? For four years, I took college courses because every course in that curriculum for that was geared for adults. It wasn't right. geared for high school. Absolutely. It was geared for adults. Absolutely. So that cyber security that he took, that cyber ethics that he took, mm -hmm. that was college ready courses, you know. Um, so talk about that a little bit. So exactly your point, right? And that's what we do. And I believe that we do it better. And this mm -hmm. is why we do it better. Mm -hmm. One, Every course that we have is taught by black men in the field, not some teacher making it up, reading the curriculum, black men in the field, right? So mm -hmm. same thing we do, we have an IT fundamentals curriculum that we pass and the whole goal is to get certifications prior to graduation, especially for young black males who may not qualify to get into anybody's engineering and computer science program. So if tech is the future and you don't qualify, on, on average, nationwide, black males graduated 50%. Out of that 50%, only 10% qualified to get into anybody's computer science or engineering program. So if tech is the future, how are we gonna balance the playing field, right? We can't, in school, in school we won't, right? Because the, because the, the recruiters in school and, and the counselors are gonna push all those kids to go to the military, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they do, they push all those kids to go to the military. So what we do, we have this program that we're calling the new opportunity for black boys. And it's just how you stated. Like as juniors, we get them in this program and the goal is to get them certifications. So imagine if we align this program with somebody going to college, right? Right. So say a college freshman goes to college mm -hmm. and without scholarships, you're coming out 15 to $30,000 in debt that first year. Right. First year kid who goes into the workforce with an IT fundamentals degree, depending on where you are in the country, 
that's going to give you an entry level salary at about thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars, depending on where you are in the country, with your mm -hmm. IT mental certification. So, say if we go year by year, that second year we get our guy his next certification was a, a A plus certification, mm -hmm. right? That that sophomore is about fifty to sixty thousand dollars in debt. Our guys made about fifty to seventy thousand dollars, and now he's with a company who's going to say. Yo, going to your junior career, going to your what would be your junior year, in order for you to move to management, we may, may need you to get some college. Mm -hmm. So he could have a choice to go to college, paid for by that company, right? By that company while having experience versus our college student going now in a hundred thousand dollars plus in debt with no experience, with no experience. Where I guy in his fourth year probably has his fourth certification, probably has a security plus certification. And even with that certification alone and four certifications, five years out, that guy is going to be making seventy five to one hundred thousand dollars where our college student is going to graduate and be looking for a job, depending on what they got their career in. Mm -hmm. And even if they come out at even salaries that are, as our guy who didn't do college, they're still two hundred thousand dollars in debt. In debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. what, path is, what path is the best, best path? And what we know from the data today that the majority of the people are struggling to pay back student loans. Yes. The majority of our young people, our millennials are struggling to pay back student loans and are now disheartened and frustrated at the fact that I did everything you told me to do. I went to school, I got good grades, I got this degree, and now I have this student debt and I still have to live with my parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what, what path is the better path? Right, right. So how how would you, how um, you say you have the programs, how would one go about getting their son enrolled or involved? Uh, two ways. So we're actually launching new programs in April because we've revamped our whole program. Because of COVID, we've needed to expand our platforms, our digital platforms. So we're relaunching programs in April, in mid-April, and um, you just have to go to missionfulfilled2030.org, get on our email list so you know when the programs come out. And uh, we're launching a 10,000 Black Boys initiative. So our goal for the rest of this year is to get 10,000 Black Boys involved in one of our tech and STEM programs. And we have three different levels. We have our Youth Tech Entrepreneurs Program, and then we have our IT fundamentals program and we have our cyber pathways program is mm -hmm. what we're doing. And we have an intro intro to um, cyber program, which is which is for everybody. We even taking that back to K through 12. Wow. Right? So all you have to do is go to missionfulfilled2030.org, get on our email list so you know when those courses come out and those programs launch. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. I'm gonna mention that again as, as uh before we close our show, so they'll make sure that they have the, all the information. But what I want to say, once you talk about a little bit now, is one of your other loves, which you do your yearly trek uh, mm -hmm. during your birth birth date. <laughs> talk about that a little bit, because that that is an incredible thing. And I, I think for a lot of men that don't travel or have a fear of travel, why? you decide that you go and you pick a place and you're yeah, like so, a native while you're there. <laughs> yeah, so um, I call it the world tour, right? And it, it happened because, you know, when I when I hit 40 years old, I realized that I hadn't, I haven't explored the world. Like I, I've, I've gone on some vacations where I've gone to the Bahamas and, you know, I've been, I grew up in Rochester, New York, so I, go to Canada all the time, but I hadn't explored the world. And, um, you know, I got to 40 and I was like, you know what, I'm going to explore the world. So on a random trip to Barcelona, you know, I booked a trip to Barcelona and I didn't know what I was going to do, but um, went to Barcelona and on my way to Barcelona, I had a layover in Iceland mm -hmm. and it was a, like a 20 hour layover. So I had a chance to explore Iceland while I was there. I decided, well, when I go to Barcelona, what am I going to do in Barcelona? So I found this app called Skyscanner, and I was going to take a train ride to Madrid. So 
So I'm looking on this app, Sky Scanner, and up pops up a trip to Rome for like 26 euros. So 26 euros is about $30, right? Wow. So I'm like, I'm gonna fly to Rome. I'm gonna fly to Rome, right? So I started mapping out this trip. So I'm in Barcelona, but I did this thing in Iceland, which I, I, I hadn't planned to go to Iceland. So now I spend a, a full day in Iceland. I get to do all of that. I go to Barcelona. I spend 24 hours in Barcelona. And the next day I book a trip to Rome. From Rome, I found a trip to um, um, Paris. Mm. So I went from Rome to Paris and I actually spent my birthday because of the different time zones. Mm -hmm. I spent my birthday um, that year in three different countries. Wow. From Barcelona to Rome to Paris, right? So I realized that traveling Europe was really cheap. So I was like, you know what? This is something that I'm going to do every year. So in the last five years, I've been to over 25 different countries. So, and, you know, so, so it's just... Now it's something that I do. So that week of my birthday, I plan this trip and I just go. And what's cool about it and what's probably scary for most people, I only plan the first destination. Mm. I plan the first destination and the rest, I make it up on the fly. So I never know where I'm going. <laughs> and then I just document it. I just document it for the people. So, you know, I've been doing that probably for the last six years. And I've been about 25 countries and it's amazing, mm. you know, what goes on in the world. And I always find black men. When I go, I find black men and I talk to them and I ask them about racism in that country mm. or what's going on in the world. And it's always interesting to get their perspective mm -hmm. of what's going on where they are, but also get their perspective of what's going on in America. Are you seeing some similarities? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like when I go, when I went to London, I went to London what, two years ago. I went to London two years ago and talking to those brothers in London, they suffer in the same, same stuff we go through here. Mm. Um, you know, a little bit different, subtle differences based on where they're from, because most of the black people you see are either from Africa. I met brothers from Africa. I met brothers from Jamaica. I met brothers from Caribbean islands and it's pretty much the same, but most most people from Africa, they come there for education mm -hmm. and then they're able to work just like the people from Africa who show up here, they show up here to get educated and it's pretty much the same thing. But this is the huge difference. All of those brothers I meet over there speak multiple languages. And we don't require speak multiple that. languages. Right. And sometimes I feel real inferior to these dudes because I met this dude. I'm in Rome and I'm just talking. I actually got a video and it's like my favorite video because I'm just walking in Rome and I'm talking to this guy. And uh, how many languages do you speak, man? I speak 12 languages. I asked him to speak every last one of them. Speak it. Right. <laughs> then I asked him about, you know, America. Like, what do you like about America? And he was hip hop. I love Eminem. I love Wiz Khalifa. I love, you know, all the rap artists. Right, that we right, right? It's right. The same. Like, it, it's, it's the same. It's just, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's what's interesting. And that's why, you know, I kind of connect with those people because just as much are, as we are different, we mm -hmm. are the same. Yeah. And I, and I, right. And I find, because um, I think I've got probably got a decade on you, the differences of when I went to school, and what was requirements versus my son coming out of high school this year and what his requirements were and the difference of what they took away. And we're so behind in, in, in math, in reading, in science, in language, it was mandatory. We took language, you know, um, in high school and they did too, but I think it was only like a year, but we had to take three years. Right. Three years language, every year was history, every year was a science, every year was a math, but they sprinkled in to those uh, subjects of uh, you had to take either home economics or you had to take another course because they were teaching you some life lessons right. in that in that 
as well, which, you know, is, is amazing. And I would tell him, you know, my school day started at 730 and it ended at four or 330, the same time as a work day for a parent. You know, his day, because they've got so many schools, his day starts at 745 and he's done at 230. Yeah. And then you're cramming in all this information for them to get to learn. And some kids, you know, are, are capable of keeping up. And then you've got some kids that don't. And then you've got some kids you've got to learn how to motivate. And when you've got 30 plus students in your class, you, you're going to grab those that gravitate instead of trying to help the ones that you know that need to be helped. And it, it, it's, a, it's a never ending cycle, you know, with teachers trying, trying to make sure that they try to get them all. Yeah. But I think, I think what the schools have not learned yet is they're cramming in a lot of information, but what percentage of that information is valuable, right? What, right. what percentage of that information is actually valuable for the student for life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you lose a lot of students. Mm -hmm. right? I was a terrible student. Was I was I um, a terrible intellectual? No. I was a terrible I can student. See that. Right. I can see that. I was a terrible student. And, and, and I, I could go back and um so I got in trouble when I um I got in trouble and um I had to do the scare straight program and I had to go through this urban league program and talk to the social worker and all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting in a meeting. I'm 15 years old at the time. I'm probably a D student. I did just enough to pass. So I'm a D student at the time. And social worker was like, like, you seem pretty bright. Like, what do we have to do to get you to do better in school? I said, nobody ever asked me what I wanted to learn. I said, at some point, if somebody would have said, hey, Gerald, what is it that you want to learn and figured out how to integrate that into the curriculum, I would have been an A student. Mm -hmm. And the schools say that, and most of the schools say that every student is entitled to their own IEP, correct? Right, right. But the only students that ever get an IEP is students that are deemed special needs. Exactly. But smart kids yeah. are special needs too. Exactly. Right? They need special stuff. So at 12 and 13 years old, I was reading engineering books. I was reading engineering books. I was designing elaborate car audio systems for for the street pharmacists in my neighborhood. <laughs> but nothing was but nothing was motivating you in the classroom. Absolutely. I get it. I get so it. I was way advanced. I was doing way advanced stuff. So the classroom wasn't interesting. And from where I'm from, mm -hmm. you're supposed to, you know, graduate and go work for Kodak, right? My parents right. were I'm first generation college. So I'm not. college. So what my parents knew is that I would work. And my father, my father was in the middle of 12 children. Mm. And my father's parents died when he was like 11 or 12. So my father basically raised himself with his brothers and sisters and um, dropped out of high school in the 10th grade out of necessity because he had to eat. Right. But he was self-taught. And I remember getting suspended from school one time and my mother and my father were having this conversation. What are we going to do about this boy getting suspended? And my father said to my mother, it is not the school's responsibility to educate our children. Mm. And that was based on his upbringing. And my father was brilliant. My father would go read books and learn from those books what he needed to do. And he did a lot of auto body work and stuff like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My father would take me to the bookstore. We had this bookstore in Rochester, New York called Worldwide News, where he would go get his auto books. And he would go and I would sit in the corner and read books about audio engineering. So I was advanced, way advanced. When I got expelled from school at 14 years old out of middle school, and um, they're, they're going to send me to alternative school. And it just so happened at the expulsion meeting, the superintendent sat in that meeting and every, you know, asked, asked my administrators from middle school, has anybody looked at Mr. Moore's New York State test record? Room got silent. He said, we don't suspend kids or expel kids from school who are testing at 12th year, 10th month and reading math and science coming out of eighth grade on my New York State test. 
right? So I had virtually tested out of high school in, in eighth grade. So there was nothing else. You know, what are you going to do with me? You going to put me in AP courses and stuff that I don't want to learn? Mm. That's not logical. Mm -hmm. It's not logical. You know, you're not going to capture people. So the only thing you could have done with me was to ask me, what is it that you want to learn? And then mold the curriculum around that. And I think what we have to do with education is figure out if everybody's entitled an IEP, it can't just be for those kids in special needs and those kids who excel, you can't just throw them in random AP courses and, and think you're going to meet the need of that student. That's I exactly right. a lot of kids. I actually meet a lot of kids who get into these AP programs and because they're really advanced, they're not really learning anything. They go to college advanced and fail because they really weren't being pushed. They were just doing exactly what they were told to do and you know, just following that path where me, I didn't make the honor roll until I got to college. Mm -hmm. Because in, in college was the first time I actually had a black male educator. Mm -hmm. In Prince George's County, that's different. It's it's a yes, black it's, everybody. Oh, when, you look at the, when you look at the, the nation, black males make up less than two percent of the public school workforce. So it's highly likely black boys across the country and black girls across the country will never have a black male educator, and that's important. Mm -hmm. Mm, that is so true. That is so true. And I think we've we've had the I've had the conversation with a couple of people because they were asking, uh, you know, where my son was going to college and he hasn't decided yet. He's still, um, you know, uh, applying to schools and he applied to one school that did uh, offer him, you know, offer him to come. And it was a smaller school and he would be a minority among, um, among the students there. And my, my philosophy was, and some people kind of disagreed with me, but my philosophy was he's coming out of an environment where his diversity is 90% or 80% black. Mm -hmm. To go there, he's going to push himself to a different level of competition. Right is what I believe. And I think once he goes off to school, he's going to be fine because like you, he's doing the bare minimal to get through high school, but you sit down and you have a conversation with him, you know, the boy's got some intelligence to him. You know, any, any time that, uh, he, you know, he looks at English and don't want to pay attention to it, but he flies through a uh, business admin, every business admin course, you know, uh, he'll have an interesting conversation with you about history, but he don't want to put in the work to do the history, but he can tell you about history. <laughs> that's my middle daughter, that's it, my middle it, daughter right yeah there. it's like you haven't found what it is to connect him right to want to stay engaged in your class right. you know so it, it, it's you know one teacher said you know he won't do half the assignments but then in a cybersecurity class he'll do the test and ace the test right i had a um I had a social studies teacher when I was in high school that would get so frustrated with me because I could learn the material. As a matter of fact, the material was easy, mm -hmm. right? So I, I would be in class or I wouldn't show up in class because the class was during another lunch period. So I just go take another <laughs> lunch period. <laughs> so, but I would always show up for the test. So one time, um, I had missed like three three days, so the test would be on Friday. So I missed like three days of class that week, and I show up for the test, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a chapter test, and um, I had all the information because I, I had the notes. Like, I, I knew what all the assignments were, mm -hmm. and I could just glance at the notes. But what I learned from him is he would put all of the answers in the test. Mm. So all of the answers for the test would be somewhere in the test. So I figured out his formula of writing the test. So I take this one test and uh, I break the curve. So he's mad because everybody else failed the test and I hadn't been in class. <laughs> and I, I got like a 90 on the test where the next the next highest score was like a 65. Wow. So he accused me of cheating. And I'm like, yo, man, I didn't cheat. I didn't cheat. And then I, I broke down to him how I got a 90. 
I was like, this is how I got a 90 because the answer to question one is in question 35. The answer to question seven is in question, I said, because the rest of the students are not smart enough to figure that out. The first thing I did when I did the test was review all the questions. Mm. That's the first thing I did. And I recognized, okay, here's a pattern here, right? Because the rest of the class is not smart enough to figure that out. You can't punish me. So, so the next time, so he, he just pissed at me. And I was like, you just, and I was just, I was, I was just hot mouth. And I was just like, you're just not that smart. So when we had got into this, we had got into this puzzle because he kept trying to throw me out. Mm -hmm. I asked him, I said, outside of reading history, what else can you do? Can you can you break down teal small parameters? I wrote a formula on the board. Can you break this down and tell me what it is? Can you build anything? Can you build anything? Can you design anything? I whipped out a picture of a car audio system that I installed. Can you do this? What can you do outside of reading? I can read really well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, got so, and I, I just, you know, that's that's just was the kind of kid I was, and I wasn't being tested at all. And you couldn't have tested me in high school. Like there, there was nothing in high school that could have tested me. No, and I needed to to be in another environment that could have adjusted to who I was as a student. Mm -hmm. But that's not what that's not what school is. Right, right. and unless you. Right. Unless you get a rare um, counselor that can recognize it, and I know uh, my my youngest brother was that way. He had a counselor that recognized that he was well way beyond what they were doing on the high school curriculum. So they built him stuff to do, right, and kept him involved in other things. So once he came out of high school, he was just ready. He was still just ready to go. And he could like you just break, you know, just break right. stuff down and, you know, um, went to college and double majored and finished in two years. Right. Well, open a book. Okay. I've never been able to do that, <laughs> but he can just open the book, read it. <laughs> I'm amazed. I'm amazed now that it's I got. Into, with, yep. <laughs> I'm amazed now that I got into being an author, mm -hmm. and um, never really thought about writing a book. But when I was young, I loved to write. Mm -hmm. I loved to write, and um, I never forget. I was in. I was a junior in high school, and I had this creative writing class. Mm -hmm. And the teacher who taught the class at the time was this guy. And when we started the year, he was told from the jump that I was a problem student. So before even getting to know me, he labeled me a problem student, right? So um, we had all these creative writing assignments and um, he had a, he had a student teacher who was working the class with him, new, new English teacher. And um, we're writing all these papers and he would always give me a oh froze up here for a minute, but he should be right back, hopefully. Gerald, if you can hear me. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, All so, right. so no matter what he, no matter what paper I turned in, he always gave me a D. So student, he gets, he gets ill. He gets ill, catches a flu or something, and had to take some time off. So the student teacher was there, and we had to read our papers in front of the class. So I get up and I'm reading this this story that I wrote in front of the class, and you know it's an exciting story. And uh, at the end, everybody's laughing and they're clapping. And so I go back, and the student teacher asked me what grade did I get on that that paper, and I said a D. And she's like, oh my God, like, so we had this folder where we had all our assignments. Mm -hmm. So she said, where are your, I said, I said, you know, he's always gonna give me a D. And then she said, what do you mean? I said, every paper I've written, I've gotten a D, right? So she was like, can I see your folder? So she takes my folder and she comes back the next day. And she was like, oh my God. She was like, I want you to do something for me because the papers were marked up. I want you to rewrite all of these papers and don't change a thing. And I'm like, why? Why? I don't want to go through all that. But I liked her. So I was like, all right, mm -hmm. I'll do this for you. She submitted those D papers 
And I was writer of the month three times in the national contest and our national school wide writer of the wow. writer of the month. For Different. Mm -hmm. so, Difference because she didn't label you coming in. Right. So the teacher comes back and she challenges them. He put her out. <laughs> he put her out uh, because and I told her, I was like, listen, like, I'm just trying to make it through. I don't I, it, it, it's no, I don't want to fight it. Like, I don't I don't want to fight it. Like, I'm not interested and my parents again my parents just knew I, I would make it through mm -hmm. for my father you know the school's mm -hmm. the school determination of who I was intellectually meant nothing to him okay so so let me yeah so let me pose this question to you because I think this is important for kids like you that don't rock the boat don't change the narrative in high school they 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 you know they check out because they're not being motivated enough but how can we still allow them or tell them to have a voice so by the time they get to college and it's important that they speak for themselves and advocate for themselves how do how do we get to that point i think that we have to make changes we have to make change and it's it's, it's teacher to teacher right mm -hmm. we have some educators who do a great job at relating to the students mm -hmm. We have a lot of teachers who are just going through the curriculum, mm -hmm. right? They're just going through the curriculum. They're not trying to relate to the teachers. They're not trying to make the curriculum culturally relevant. Mm -hmm. right? And I think we have to do a better job at that, making curriculum culturally relevant, relating to the students, meeting the students where they are. And with these Gen Z kids, we talk about a whole different breed. We can't even, you know, when we go from generation to generation, we're talking about a whole different breed of kids every time because the technology that these kids have. Yes. Our Gen Z kids have grown up with technology. They've grown up with the internet. They've grown up with YouTube. They've grown up with Google. They've grown up with all these things. So education needs to change. Because right now, why wouldn't any kid tell you, well, why do I need to learn this when I got Google? Right. Google, right? Right. Like, touch in my hand. I got a supercomputer right here in my hand. Mm -hmm. And if I need to know what happened to Zeus in Greek mythology, I can look it up in two minutes. Why do I need to store it here? So I think I think we have to look at, you know, what what education is, how do we mold these kids into a new education system? And of course, there's things you need to learn, but I think more what we need to focus on is teaching kids how to think and how to learn, right? Yeah, right. How to think and how to learn. And um, I had a, I had a, um, I had a science teacher, black woman, and um, she was really hard on me because she knew I had potential, right? And one day I was sitting and I was talking to her. <laughs> And she was like, how do you know all this stuff? And I was like, I teach myself this stuff. I was like, I'm interested. And she shot out a word to me. She was like, you autodidact. <laughs> I'm like, what is what is that? It just means self-taught. Right. We need to teach kids how to learn, how to teach themselves. They have the tools to do it. And I think we need to get to a position where the school system is just a guide. The school system is just a guide to what you want to learn. And with technology, we can actually do that. We can actually create independent paths for independent students just because of the technology that we have. And actually put the kids on a kind of a self-paced journey that meets a standard to get them to either the college or to the workforce. And look at what... Um, Look at what our big social media companies are doing today. Mm -hmm. Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook have all said that college is not going to be the determining factor on whether we give you a job. All of those organizations have put out their own curriculum. Mm -hmm. They've all put out their own curriculum and said, if you take this software development curriculum, this will get you a start at 75000 If you take this curriculum, so when we're looking at school, like the education system is about to be disrupted mm -hmm. right, by these companies. Right. Like, I, I view Mission Fulfilled as a as an education system disruptor. 
because if I had it my way and what my goal is in the next five years is to have these mission fulfilled tech centers all across the country, where as a parent, you could pull your kid out of school and bring them to our mission fulfilled tech center, especially for black boys mm -hmm. and have your kid get a high tech education that is taught by black men in the field surrounded and having the technology where we could sprinkle in those bare minimum English requirements, but we can put kids on the path that they want to be on. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. I have enjoyed our conversation. I'm going to ask again, I think I got the information here, but I want to put it again. So for further information, and I definitely want you back on after you have your new platforms uh, come out in April so we can talk again about it. And as you're now, are you going to do it like um, you're having signups maybe every quarter or monthly or how are you? So we're going to we're going to have actually we have a rolling platform. Actually, okay. we have a rolling platform that will continue to do programming year round and on our learning management system. We can we learn at your own pace and then we do groups, right? So we may have a group of kids who sign up at any given moment, but then we'll have these group sessions where we can bring in a certain amount of kids per cohort and actually talk about what they're learning. Um, talk about what they're learning. Um, are you struggling with anything? You know, and, and provide them that type of support. And then um in the black men that we have working with our organization, we're gonna have office hours where you could actually tap in with somebody who's an engineer or a computer scientist and actually ask questions and, and figure out different paths you wanna be on. And our goal is to give a variety of opportunities because we don't know what kids wanna learn. We don't know if kids wants to do coding. We don't wanna know if a kid wants to do UX, UI design, internet of things, artificial intelligence, right? All our, all our schools are promoting coding, coding, coding. Well, let's do that. If I'm a graphic artist, I don't care about coding. I care about UX, UI design, mm -hmm. right? So we want to be able to give kids options to explore these careers. And not only do that, through our Young Tech Entrepreneurs Program, we actually have every kid create a product, right? So we teach every kid how to create their own tech company by using free open source tools. So now we, we're in a situation where the kid is like, okay, I'm invested in this learning because I can actually make real money today. Like yeah. this, this is not play play. Like our Young Tech Entrepreneurs Program is for real. Mm -hmm. And you can make real money. And we teach these kids how to use the tools that they're playing with every day. So we teach you how to create a product. Then we teach you how to leverage social media tools that you're using every day to market yourself. So instead of looking like a fool on social media, you can market your tech company. And you're catering to from K to 12. Is that correct? K to 12. K to 12. So we're working on a lot of stuff for our younger kids. But right now, most of our curriculum is probably sixth grade through 12 through our young tech entrepreneurs through our okay. certification programs but mm -hmm. we're working on stuff for our younger kids okay all right wonderful wonderful information wonderful information gerald thank you so much for coming on to the show i really enjoyed it i have your information out here for everyone to please 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 take the information if you don't need it i'm sure you know a kid or family that does. Please pass the information on. Um, tell us again the areas right now that you have your, your program and where you're working to expand. Right now, because of COVID, we can do everything virtual. We can do everything virtual through our learning management system. So you can go to missionfulfilled2030.org, get on that email list. We're going to be sending out our new course offerings shortly. Uh, we have a new 10,000 Black Boys Initiative where we want to get 10,000 Black boys involved in some type of tech or STEM program this year. Uh, black boys, it's is, is really important that we support Black boys because if we support Black boys, we're supporting the Black family, right? And that's what's important about the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you. As you have new information coming out, please be sure to get it to me so I can share it with everyone. 
And let's let's make a, a date for you to come back on during the summertime, because a lot of times kids are going to be out. It's going to be interesting to see what they're going to do this summer. Last summer, we know everybody was indoors. There was a lot of restrictions. Now that the restrictions are coming off, let's see. Uh, I'd like to have you back at the beginning of summer to see what programs and platforms that you'll have available for those kids that are really looking to do something else along with a sport. Absolutely. So you're going, to see, right. you're going to see a lot of what's going on because we're about to start highlighting a lot of kids on our social media. Yes, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. And I, I know you 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 have your vision and your community activist. I know you have gone in your pocket and given away uh, equipment for kids that needed it, uh, particularly last year. Uh, you know, when every all the kids were going home and needed to have, you know, uh, computer equipment at home to be able to do virtual learning, you 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 just continue to give. And I applaud you and I celebrate you and thank you, thank you. for stepping up and, and leading the charge for our kids. And I appreciate you hosting these spaces. We can show people who are doing great work in the community and we definitely need to expand because everything for our black community is a community effort and those people who are unseen and unknown need to have visibility so that the community at large can support so you know i thank you to everybody who supports mission build and the great outpouring once people figure out what we're doing you know they want to see us be successful so i'm grateful to you and bringing me on this platform to expand the vision i appreciate that thank you so much Everybody, this concludes our show for this evening. Once again, I want to thank my guest, Gerald A. Moore Sr. You see his book, Motivate Black Boys, and I see the other book behind you that we didn't even talk about this evening, When Men Lean In, We All Win and the importance of that. But you covered and encompassed all of that in our conversation today, why that is important when men step up to, to lead and take care and charge and help our youth be the next generation of leaders and motivators, innovators, creators, entrepreneurs, leaders. <laughs> With that, I'm going to close this evening. My next show will not be until April 10th. I am excited to have the one and only Steph Wood on my show. Basketball entrepreneur, basketball coach, mentor, speaker, incredible. Cannot wait to have her on the show. Thank you again, Gerald. For everybody else, thank you so much for turning, turning in. I am Jones Harwell, and this has been Journeys with Jones Harwell. See you next time.